Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Lindsay Detroit. I've known her for um, all of her, boy, I think maybe going on 20 years or so. And uh, Lindsay is a professor and extension plant pathologist at Washington State University. We're very, very fortunate to have a, a seed plant pathologist in our state. There are very few of them across the country. And one of the reasons she's here is because we are a center of specialty seed production nationally and internationally. And I've uh, been so grateful for Lindsay's openness and willingness to advise and um, participate in the organic seed sector, as well as the broader seed industry. She studies the origins, spread, patterns, and management of diseases affecting vegetable and vegetable seed crops, with a focus on crops that are particularly uh, suitable to our region, including spinach, brassicas, carrot, onion, radish, and beets. Um, as I mentioned, Lindsay's always been very um, uh, inclusive of the organic sector. And the very first year that I worked at Organic Seed Alliance, I was researching organic spinach seed production. And I called Lindsay, and this is a testimonial to her personality. She said, well, I've got a bunch of books here in my office. You can just come up and use it. Like I've got a little library here. Just come on up and hang out in my office and work on it. And, and I did. And it was one of the first introductions that I had of working with Lindsay in that sense of if there's a resource she has, she's open to sharing it. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, this topic was one of the top rated topics among participants. As we mentioned before, the agenda was set by you all who are here, uh, who have filled out the registration, who provided feedback following up on the last Washington Seed Summit. And seed pathology is often this sort of um, unknown scary place that sometimes growers don't want to have to think about, don't want to have to deal with, and it's a little overwhelming. And Lindsay does an amazing job of just breaking it down in terms of how do you approach this topic, which, which uh, has a large implications in not only the quality of the seed that you produce, but the role that you play as part of the agricultural community, because Diseases in seed can affect not only your own yields and your own quality of your crop, um, but also your customers who buy that seed and plant that seed if they're inadvertently receiving seed-borne diseases, as well as your neighboring farms in your region. So she will touch a little bit on some of those implications and how to be a good um, steward of the region in terms of uh, not being fearful of diseases, but acknowledging and managing the risks. So, um, I will invite you all to go ahead and add questions to the chat as we go along. And uh, we will take a few questions as they're particularly pertinent to the topics that she's raising and addressing, but we'll also save a little bit of time at the end of the session and have a, a Q&A um, follow-up too. So. All right, with that, Lindsay, thank you so much for being here. I've been huge in my own education and I appreciate you taking time today to share your, your knowledge too. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michaela. I appreciate the opportunity to share with this group and apologize that I haven't been able to participate in too much of the meeting. Um, as Michaela said, I, I think the key thing to keep in mind as we go through this talk is not to become terrified of <laughs> all things disease-wise and seed production. But I think really important to try and increase your awareness of the problems that can occur and what steps you can take to be um, limiting the risk of um, you encountering one of these in your seed production. As Michaela said, it, it's pretty major repercussions, not just for you, depending on the type of disease that could show up, but if you end up selling infected seed to growers, um, you can create a, a major headache and sometimes pretty economically damaging headache for the farm that farms that purchase seed from you. So I, I don't want everyone to be in fear, but I think a key thing to recognize that ignorance is probably the biggest risk when it comes to these diseases, that taking the time to be informed, to understand what the risks are and recognizing what steps you can take to try and reduce that risk. And so that's what I hope you get out of this is just awareness and uh, the kinds of things you wanna think about in your decision-making. You have a lot to consider um, and disease is just one of these. So 
I'll uh, go ahead and start with the next slide, which really is what we've just talked about is some of the criteria when you are um, venturing into seed production or you're an established seed grower is there's a, not, a lot of criteria you're trying to meet. You're trying to produce a variety that is true to type genetically to the to characteristics that you're, you're selling in that variety. And so things like isolation of your seed crops, uh, making sure you got good pollination and the right pollination if you're in a seed production area that you, you're not getting your crops too close together, um, that you're not potentially getting, uh, if you're trying to cross different lines, if you are doing hybrid, that you're not getting inbred seed, if that's those are traits you're trying to combine and so on. So true to, trueness to type genetically is a key characteristic. Uh, high quality in terms of seed germination, seed vigor and shelf life are things you're trying to achieve because you don't want to be selling seed that, you know, only half the seed come up or the seed is very weak when it comes up. So those are all traits you're trying to achieve. And the pathogen free status, such as is the area that I focus on, is just one of these characteristics of importance for you as a seed grower. You're also trying to produce seed that's free of other things like weed seed, debris, particularly if you're moving to seed to an area where certain weeds are considered noxious and, and of major concern. And then, of course, production costs are a key thing. I heard someone say, how, how, what price do you put? How do you determine the price for the seed you sell? And varieties that are much more difficult to grow because of their sensitivity to certain stresses in the seed production crop can, can increase the cost for you and therefore the price of that. Um, so just putting disease in perspective and all these criteria that you have to think about and really what is the potential impact of these diseases if they appear in your seed crops, you can have a direct yield loss in terms of um, reduction and growth. Um, so you can get a reduction in seed yield in terms of quality and or quantity. Um, but very importantly for your uh, customer, if that harvested seed is contaminated, in other words, proper gills of the pathogen mixed in with the seed or actually infested, seeds colonized externally or internally, you can get a reduction in the seed quality. You know, some pathogens will reduce seed germination and vigor. There's a risk of seed transmission if it is a seed transmitted pathogen. Um, the folks that plant that then have a potential risk of, of infection of har harvested product being infected. And, and very importantly, there's a risk that you could move pathogens into areas where they're not established onto a farm that doesn't have that disease or potentially distribute new races or strains of a pathogen that might be more aggressive, more virulent in terms of their impact than what a grower is already dealing with. So these are just why we try obviously to produce clean seed. And I'm just gonna show you an example here. It's it's a study we did a long time ago and it, 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 it forget, just ignore the names of the products on the bottom of this, on the x-axis on this graph, what I want you to look at, this is a fungal disease, Alton area, black spot or a pod spot in brassica seed crops. You can see what it does to the pods. Uh, we were looking at um, treatments to try to reduce the amount of disease on the, the seed that you harvest. You can, so this, these, the height of the bar just represents the amount of disease that we observed in this trial over the season. Um, and then if you look at this next slide, which is exact same treatments we had before, this is the seed germination. And if you look at the previous slide, this was the amount of disease in the field. And now you see direct inverse correlation with the quality of the seed that was harvested from those plots. So uh, you don't pay any attention to the names on the bottom of the slide. It's just to show you how the amount of disease for some pathogens can directly affect seed quality. Other pathogens, we see no correlation between the amount of disease and seed quality. You can have a high level infection and still have high seed germination, seed vigor, but some things are direct. So in this particular pathogen, it's alternaria, you can see a seed of cabbage plated out on a petri dish and the ones that have that fuzzy black growth on them are all infected with alternaria. And we saw a very strong negative correlation between the amount of disease in the crop, the seed crop, and the seed quality um, in terms of germination at, at harvest. So just because I had some fungicides listed on there, I'm required by WSU to put a, this slide up that says you must follow the label if you use any products that WSU is not liable. <laughs> so all that. So let's look at how you might approach managing diseases and reducing that risk that you have these diseases. One of the benefits of where we are is that we have a really good climate for seed production. So seed production tends to be focused in, um, in geographic locations that are ideal for that those species requirements. So most seed production in the U.S. is in drier states, at least when in the stage of the crop where the seed is forming on the plant and maturing and senescing, um, that it's usually dry because 
moisture drives fungal and bacterial pathogens in seed crops. And so even though we have a lot of rain in Western Washington, we tend to have about a three month period of low rainfall. And that usually is during that peak period of seed maturation, senescence and, and harvest, which is ideal for seed production. And I list here a number of um, crops that are very specifically located in Western, uh, specifically, particularly the Pacific Northwest US because of the ideal climate. So in bean seed production is focused in the Pacific Northwest, particularly because of any of the bacterial pathogens that are very rarely seed borne and seed transmitted, as well as anthracnose, which is a fungal disease. Pea seed, similarly, there's uh, bacteria like Pseudomonas um, that can be a problem. Um, Ascochyto, a fungal disease that is also a problem. So the pea seed industry tends to be located in the Pacific Northwest. With brassicas, Western and Central Washington are ideal for seed production, as well as say, parts of California for broccoli seed production, because we're trying to control diseases like blackleg, which is a fungal disease, and black rot, which is a bacterial disease that are very, very readily seed borne very rarely seed transmitted, very explosive in, in situations where you plant out infected seed. So we have a, a good climate for producing these crops, whether they're annuals or biennials, but we also have a climate that tends to be less favorable for these pathogens. On a more local scale, um, some things to consider is can you avoid areas that might have more conducive conditions, such as areas prone to fogs, um, down to river valleys where moisture collects areas prone to more dews, less air movement. You've got lots of tall trees around a field, you get a lot less airflow. Um, you get higher, <clears throat> longer periods of humidity, leaf wetness, less drying out of the canopy. Um, and the, that moisture in the canopy is one of the biggest drivers of fungal and bacterial diseases in seed production. So can you avoid those kinds of local environments that might um, create more favorable conditions for diseases? In most of the seed crops I work with, well, almost all of them are cross-pollinated, so we tend to have to isolate these crops anyway. So isolation of crops, not only in terms of pollen separation is important, but it also helps with disease management because diseases spread, whether they're windblown spores, splash dispersed, insect vected, they can move around. So when you have that spatial isolation for pollen, it adds to a step of separation for um, pathogens as well. However, um, we run into problems when you have, for example, biennials, because there's an overlap in that season and you can have what we call a green bridge that provides host material for con constant spread and propagation of the pathogen or the vector if it's insect vected over time. This is also a problem in areas like Western Washington, where we have a very high concentration of, say, for example, brassica seed crops, as well as many, many brassica commercial crops that we're selling to eat, consumption crops, that can be grown year round because we have a mild climate and many farms are growing brassicas year round. And that's one of the most high risk scenarios I've run into in Western Washington uh, with these seed borne pathogens in brassica seed crops is this concentration of a broad range of brassicas that are all susceptible to black leg and black rot. So one of the key things to think about, are there situations in your production um, where you can break that green bridge temporarily and spatially? Um, and it's sometimes easier said than done, but this is an important thing to consider. Oops, sorry, I, I realize I, I've got two screens up. I didn't realize I wasn't going through this. So here's here's the, <laughs> sorry, the text that I was busy going through. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to show you a situation that came up last fall, uh, September of 22 in Western Washington. I received a call from a grower saying, I think I have black rot in my field. Someone visited the farm and said, this is what they think. And can you come and confirm this diagnosis? So I went out to the farm. This is a picture I took on the farm. And this is the worst case of black rot I've ever seen in my career as a plant pathologist. Fortunately, this farm was not a seed production farm. but as you can see in this picture, in the front is cabbage. All those yellow uh, marginal lesions you can see on cabbage are all black rot lesions. Behind it is a, is a green cabbage. Behind that is a flowering broccoli. Behind that is kale. This farm, 80% of its production was brassicas. And there was black rot all over the place. So when you look up close at a leaf, you can see the very distinct symptoms. Uh, black rot tends to start marginally because um, I, I have taken this picture that I actually took on this farm early in the morning when I visited. And you can see these 
gutation droplets in the morning when there's a lot of dew and there was heavy fog in the valley. Um, you can see these gutation droplets forming on the edge of the leaf. And as the temperature rises during the day and it gets drier, the plant actually sucks those gutation droplets back in through the ends of the veins, those openings called hydrothodes at the ends of the veins. And this is where bacteria very readily, like Xanthomonas, get into leaves. And that's why you see a lot of these V-shaped lesions along, start along the margin and move in. And when I took a knife and cut, I pulled one of these leaves off and cut through the pediol or the midrib of that leaf, you can see that infection had actually gone systemic. You can see how it was moving down the vein of that uh, leaf towards the stem. And when I cut the stems open on some of these plants, you can see the black discoloration where the xanthomonas infection had gone fully systemic in this plant. Now, these this was not a seed crop, as I said, but the exact same situation can happen in a seed crop. And because this pathogen goes systemic in brassicas, it can get into the seed very rarely. So this is why black rot is a quarantine disease in parts of six counties in northwestern Washington is to try and limit the risk of introducing black rot on seed into the seed production region to try and keep this as black rot free in area as we can to support the um, brassica seed production in, in this region. So this is a, a definitely a disease you want to keep in mind. It's definitely a disease that you do not want to get on your farm. You don't, do not want to be selling on your seed. Uh, fortunately, you can hot water treat brassica seed um, to eliminate infection, but if you have a heavily infected seed lot, usually you, you're not able to eradicate the pathogen. But it, the good thing is there is an organic seed treatment that can be very helpful with this disease. So this is an example of a disease that's been on a quarantine status in Washington since 2006. Um, I've seen three cases since then of black rot showing up and requiring crop destruction if it's in the protected area of that quarantine. And crop destruction becomes very expensive for the seed grower. It becomes very expensive for the seed company if, if the grower is producing for a company. Um, and then it also creates a long-term risk that the grower has to try to figure out how to get rid of that inoculum and, and manage that production. So this situation happened last fall, was um, really hard to see. and. Um, we had to work closely with Washington State Department of Agriculture and the grower to look at what the risks were, how to limit that risk to farms around the area, how to um, begin to manage all that inoculum that's in these fields and reduce the disease uh, risk for that grower in the future. Um, other examples of this green bridge effect, and as I mentioned in that farm, 80% of their production was brassicas. And so the pathogen could just keep spreading and they were growing brassicas year round. That is the worst case scenario because of that lack of a break in that green bridge. We did some work with uh, carrot bacterial blight. Um, carrot seed production is really in the US concentrated in central Oregon, central Washington. Um, this is what the disease can do to the foliage and to the umbels, very readily seed borne. And we did a study quite a few years ago where we were monitoring the residues that become aerosolized behind the combine or after harvest and, and whether you're doing hand hand harvesting and threshing or machine, regardless, you're gonna create a lot of aerosolized particles. And we were able to trap the pathogen, the, the bacterial blight pathogen of carrot in those aerosolized particles up to a mile downwind of a combine, um, just to show you the degree to which this pathogen has the ability to de stand, withstand desiccation in that completely dried out uh, plant tissue and be, be blown around. And so this is why, for example, in central Oregon, where they have a pretty dense concentration of carrot seed crops, they really struggle with this disease because that half mile ice separation for pollen contamination is not adequate to prevent uh, those aerosolized uh, residues uh, behind a combine from being able to blow over that distance. A really classic example that illustrates breaking this green bridge and how it can be very effective at preventing uh, disease spread is uh, related to table beet seed production in Western Washington. So as you know, table beets are biennial. Um, and they, they planted out in, in the summer, in the fall, usually they're topped and then basically overwintered in the ground. They may be put into windrows and covered with soil. And then in the spring, they planted out um, and grown on the mainland in, in uh, uh, Western Washington um, and, you know, co harvested, combined, and everything was great. But this is about a 15-month crop, and there's a three-month overlap from season to season between the previous se biennial season's crop and the next. And in the 1970s, there was a major um, 
well, actually, in the 1940s, was a major decline in beet seed yields in Western Washington, and the seed growers didn't know what it was. They invited a pathologist out to try and figure out what's going on because seed yields were down to 10% of what they should have been. The pathologist was able to recognize there were viruses that were infecting these crops, and they were aphid vectored viruses. So when current season's crop was starting to senesce and dry down, the aphids would just fly off to the next thing they could feed on. And very often it was a beet seed crop uh, next door in close proximity to the previous season's crop that was senescing. So the aphid population and the virus concentration in those aphids was building up tremendously and there was no break in that green bridge. So as a result of this, the industry has implemented beet seed industry in Western Washington has implemented a policy whereby in the winter time, there are no beets grown for seed cr crops on the mainland. All of the beet beds are planted on Whidbey Island so that through the winter, there is no green bridge that would allow this virus to persist and the aphids to persist. And then the spring that transplanted out into the mainland. And it's basically eliminated these viruses as uh, having any major economic impact on beet seed production. It's an expensive process, logistically a pain, <laughs> but um, it, it works and it's very, very effective. Similarly in California where lettuce seed production is big, they've implemented a one month lettuce free period to minimize the risk of lettuce mosaic virus, which is aphid born and really aphid transmitted from building up into this massive population and decimating the lettuce seed production industry. So these are two examples of where isolation and breaking that green bridge can be extremely effective at eliminating a, a problem that is otherwise very devastating. A problem we've seen, for example, in, in central Washington is with onions. Onions uh, are a big crop for bulb production in central Washington, is about 24,000 acres, um, but it's also an important area for onion seed production. So we have spring sown bulb crops, fall sown bulb crops, and we have volunteers, and we have these seed crops, biennial seed crops. And Iris yellow spot virus is a virus that's vectored by thrips. Thrips like the hot, dry climate of central Washington. Um, they do extremely well in that climate and they can fly, the adults can fly. So when you see, for example, this picture on the left, um, there was an onion seed crop biennial that's planted um, right next to an onion bowl crop that was planted the next spring when the seed crop senesced and was going down in July. Uh, the thrips flew over to the onion bowl crop. This is an infrared photo, so red is healthy, brown is, is not healthy. And all this brown area to the uh, right side of this center pivot field, you can see, um, are basically decimated by iris yellow spot virus. The picture on the right-hand side is an onion seed crop in central Oregon. You can see how the um, left side of this field was not looking good at all. This was all a loss to iris yellow spot virus because the area of the field that was fallow in, at the time this photo was taken was the previous season's biennial onion seed crop. So as that was going down, the thrips just migrated over to the, the seedlings that were growing in this field the fall prior, the virus propagated, the thrips propagated, and you ended up with a very serious loss. So this is a classic example of highest risk for these pathogens where you've got a concentration of overlapping crops or production crops and seed crops side by side as we see with brassicas in Western Washington. So that's a really important concept to think about. Um, it's, it's very effective when it can be implemented. It becomes very difficult for uh, crops like brassicas where we have so many different brassicas and the black leg and black rock pathogens go to almost all brassicas. So crop rotation is another important cultural practice to think about. One of the real benefits of smaller, more diversified farms is that you tend to have a wider diversity of host ranges that you're growing, host plant species that you're growing. And most plant pathogens are fairly host specific. Um, there are some exceptions like black rot and black leg. They are specific to brassicaceae, but we have a lot of brassicaceae uh, crops that we grow in Western Washington. Um, so crop rotation can be very, very effective when you have a very narrow host range for a pathogen um, and you can have a, a host free period in a particular field. So the effectiveness of crop rotation for disease management in seed crops is really impacted by the host range of the pathogen, whether the pathogen is a foliar disease, causes a foliar disease, or if it's a soil borne pathogen. So soil borne pathogens have evolved to persist in soil and they tend to be recalcitrant and be able to survive a long time. 
foliar pathogens tend not to survive in soil except in the, when they're present in host tissue. So you harvest a seed crop, there's residues left. If you incorporate those residues into the soil, those residues break down. The quicker those residues are broken down by microbial degradation and, uh, and other degradation, the, the sh shorter the persistence of those foliar pathogens in soil. So crop rotation is very effective for controlling fo foliar pathogens and getting the inoculum reduced in your field. Um, but with soil-borne pathogens, because of the longevity of that inoculum in the soil, it, it tends to require even longer rotations. Crop rotation is also influenced by how resistant the varieties are that you're growing um, and the cultural practices you use to try and help say, break up those residues afterwards. You also want to be aware of potential asymptomatic hosts, including weeds. So some pathogens can go to weed species. And if you've got really weedy fields and those happen to be hosts to a pathogen you're trying to get rid of, if you're not controlling those weeds as well, you could continue to maintain some of that population. Um, I've mentioned some of the issues of spatial isolation with overlapping bi biennial and annual crops and these weeds and volunteers. Um, a lot of the times when you harvest a seed crop, there's shattering of seed, that seed can germinate, create volunteers. And we have seen in cases where that seed lot was infected that the volunteers that grew from that seed in that field the next spring um, were infected and allowed propagation of the pathogen. So let me see, okay. Another cultural practice is, is looking at, can you destroy inoculum in the fields? So I've, I've mentioned this to some degree about getting rid of infected debris or seed that remains after harvest. Um, there's ways to look at trying to suppress inoculum. If you have soil-borne pathogens, I'll discuss a few examples of, with you. Um, in the past, burning um, has, has been utilized to try and control um, pathogen inoculum. Grass seed crops used to be burned very extensively, but that there's an environmental hazard related to the smoke, um, the danger in the Willamette Valley, they've outlawed burning because of all the traffic accidents that used to happen on I-5 with the grass seed crops that were burned. Um, but the part of that reason for burning was to get rid of inoculum of pathogens that were not soil borne, the foliar pathogens. Um, we've, there are, is documentation of actually running some kind of a vacuum over fields to suck up things like sclerotia of the white mole pathogen and, and reduce that inoculum load. I, I don't know how effective that really is in terms of practicality, um, but, you know, again, it's just all about trying to remove inoculation. Um, there's a lot of work done on things like biofumigation. So if you're dealing with a soil borne pathogen, can you plant a cover crop um, that has biofumigant properties like some of the high glucosinolate mustards um, and other brassicas that you then incorporate into the soil. Those biofumigant particles are released and they help break down some of the soil-borne inoculum. Soil solarization is used in climates that are very hot and very sunny, so really not effective for climates like Western Washington and even in central Washington with such a short season because we have cold winters and pretty cool spring, uh, soil solarization tends to really be more relevant for uh, places like California, Texas, and so on. I'm just going to give you a few examples of, of how crop residues um, can contribute to, or volunteers can contribute to diseases. So in spinach seed production, we have a number of fungi that cause leaf spots. Um, for example, in this picture, cladosporin variably, which causes the symptoms you see on the left, Stymphalium in particular um, on the right. These pathogens are quite readily seed borne in spinach seed crops and quite readily seed transmitted. What we have shown over the years of working with these pathogens in spinach seed crops in Western Washington is that when you harvest a spinach seed crop, there's a tremendous amount of seed that is shattered. Those volunteers grow in the winter because spinach is quite cold tolerant. And we have found um, the Cladosporum leaf spot pathogen forming leaf spots on these volunteers in the winter. Uh, which just allows that pathogen to continue to propagate. Interestingly enough, the Stymphalium pathogens, we don't see them growing on the leaves of these volunteers in the winter, but we do see them producing their fruiting bodies on the seed stalk tissue, the dead stalk tissue, which is almost woody in nature. If you take a close look at these little black fruiting bodies microscopically, um, you can see inside these are these sacs, hundreds if not thousands of these sacs. Each one of these sacs produces eight of these spores as these fruiting bodies mature, and they forcibly discharge the spores through that opening in the middle of the, of the fruiting body starting around January. 
So we've done a number of studies, um, including with a current PhD student in my program, looking at when these fruiting bodies are releasing these spores. So this, for example, is a picture of uh, data she collected from 2019 through the winter into 2020. So starting in November, she put these residues out in the field and every week would go out and sample and look at these fruiting bodies microscopically to say, okay, when are the fruiting bodies present? That's the blue line. These fruiting bodies are called pseudothesia. When do they produce these spores called ascospores? You can start to see that really the spores are only starting to be detected in January, but when are they actually shooting them out? You can see by the green lines. So these ascospores are being released over a considerable period from January through to June of that particular season. When she did this again in 2020, 21 and 2021, 20, 22, you can start to see if you look at that green line, there's quite a long period that these spores are being released from residues. And we have here these shaded boxes that represent the next season spinach seed crop season. So you can see that wherever these green lines are up high and overlap with the shaded box, that's potentially a source of inoculum that's contributing to stemphilium leaf spot for the next season. And this is why it's so important when you harvest, say, a spinach seed crop, that you don't just leave those residues sitting on the soil over winter because that allows this fungus to continue to produce inoculum that's then aerially dispersed, blown around, and not just splash dispersed. And so you could be affecting your potential capacity to have inoculum as well as your neighbors if, if these spores get blown around, which we know they do. Um, thinking about suppressing pathogens, um, a, a very serious disease we deal with in spinach seed production in Western Washington is fusarium wilt. This is a photo I took in 2018 of a spinach seed crop in Western Washington. Um, it's a hybrid seed crop, you can tell, but because um, the male rows are the darker green and the female rows are all dying from fusarium wilt. This is a field that had not had spinach for 18 years. So it should have been safe for the grower to go back and plant a spinach seed crop. And the grower called me up and said, what's going on? I went out to the field and you can see the female line in this case is just um, very, very susceptible and, and widespread loss. Um, so she said she ended up with 25% of her expected yield for this field. So we've been doing a whole bunch of work trying to figure out how do we help spinach seed growers in Western Washington and Western Oregon manage fusarium wilt because it does extremely well in the acid soils of this region. Um, fusarium wilts tend to do much better on acid soils than alkaline soils. Our soils are naturally acidic. We can't just make them alkaline and sustained alka alkaline shift, um, but we can look at ways to try and create less favorable soil condition for this pathogen so we can re reduce that rotation interval from 20 years down to maybe 10 years or even eight years or five years and get a uh, more feasible ability to produce seed crops in this area. So we've looked at things like mustard seed meals, mustard cover crops, um, particularly because of that biofumigant property, we do see some suppression. Um, the difficulty here is that we have such a cool short season getting good vegetative growth and not having these brassicas growing all winter when you worry about things like black leg and black rot means it's it's not quite as feasible as um, growing these uh, brassica cover crops in central Washington where they have warmer season, more growing degree days, greater capacity to get these crops up and producing biomass and incorporated in the fall. One of the things that has been really effective is looking at how we can use limestone, calcium carbonate, agricultural limestone to suppress spinach fusarium wilt. So we've done many years of studies looking at different rates of limestone amendment to shift our soils from being quite acidic, usually in pHs in the fives, towards neutral, towards pH seven. So we've looked at different rates of amendment. We looked at um, you know all kinds of studies. We've shown a very, very dramatic ability to suppress fusarium. We never eradicate it, but we make it less severe by adding agricultural limestone. Um, so this figure shows data from a PhD student, Emily Gatch's um, work, looking at different rates of limestone amendment that's equivalent to one or two tons per acre, a single application versus uh, multiple, uh, an application every year for four years, looking at the tremendous ability to be able to grow spinach seed crops on less than 15 years and still have a feasible yield. So I really encourage you to look at, if you are a spinach seed grower, to know what your soil pH is, look at whether you can utilize agricultural limestone amendment to try to get uh, better suppression of this disease. Other cultural practices to think about for seed production is um, irrigation. So 
um, as I made, I made a comment in the last session that one of the climate change impacts I've seen um, definitely over the last 23 years I've been in this job is we tending to get hotter, drier summers in Western Washington. We tending to need to irrigate more than we used to have to for seed production in Western Washington. Where irrigation is needed for seed production, there are things you can think about about how you irrigate to try to manage diseases. So as I said, fungal and, path and bacterial pathogens tend to be driven very intensely by moisture. The more extended time there is that the canopy stays wet, the higher the risk that fungal and bacterial pathogens can, can develop and build up. So you look at ways that you can modify your irrigation to reduce the duration that your canopy stays wet, to minimize the risk of splash dispersal of pathogens, and to lower the humidity in the canopy. So one, one obvious is switching from, say, overhead irrigation like sprinklers to some form that doesn't splash like drip or furrow. Now, that's easier said than done. There's a tremendous cost. There's an expertise associated with drip irrigation. Um, so it's, it's not a solution to everything, but it's just a consideration if you are needing to irrigate to produce seed crops. The pictures I have on the slide on the right, um, this is a bean seed crop, and uh, you can see these bean pods are infected with halo blight, which is a quarantine pathogen for bean seed production in Washington and in Idaho. So if you get halo blight in a bean seed crop in Western Washington, you have to destroy that crop. There is no way to treat seed to prevent seed transmission. Um, so it's, it's a very expensive disease if it shows up. The bottom picture is um, a photo I took in 2018 when I took class. I, I, I teach a field plant pathology class. I took these students to visit a bean seed grower in central Washington who had a seed crop detected positive with halo blight, had to destroy the crop and said, I can't afford this kind of loss in the future. So he ended up switching to drip irrigation for bean seed production. Now he's a grower who has tremendous expertise in, in drip irrigation for other crops. So he was able to figure out how to do bean seed production on drip irrigation. It's more expensive, but he's been able to work it out and it's, it's enabled him to continue to be a bean seed grower um, in central Washington. Other things you can look at, especially if you have to use overhead irrigation, is how can you change the timing of your irrigation um, to minimize how long that canopy stays wet? So if you water towards the end of the day and the nights get cooler, the canopy is going to stay wet for longer. So that if you can, if you can irrigate in the morning so that as the day warms up and dries out, particularly in the summer, um, you have a shorter period that that canopy stays wet. And that's a really important way to try to minimize this risk. Likewise, frequency of irrigation can play a big role. If you irrigate very regularly, um, you're basically creating longer durations that that canopy stays wet and increasing the risk of pathogen dispersal and disease development. So longer irrigations less frequently are actually better than short frequent irrigations because of this need to keep that canopy dry for longer. Um, we've also worked with growers showing that less frequent irrigation but deeper irrigations earlier in the season encourage the crop to root deeper. So when you get into those very hot periods, particularly central Washington, where you have to put on a fair amount of water to keep up with that transpirational demand, there's a greater buffering capacity of that crop because it's rooted deeper, it can access a deeper profile of soil moisture and you don't have to irrigate as frequently um, if you can force that crop to root deeper. So these are really... Um, important aspects to consider if irrigation is necessary in your seed production. Um, I, I won't go into detail on this for the sake of time because um, there's a lot to cover, so I'll, I'll just skip some of these slides to help get us through some of the topics. But um, Other cultural practices are looking at how you can plant your crop to take advantage of things that are favorable for the crop and less favorable for pathogens. Um, this is perhaps less feasible with seed crops because of the specific planting dates needed to ensure good uh, pollination, good nicking if you're doing a hybrid and you've got different parent lines. Um, so it's less of a choice for seed crops than it is perhaps for production crops. But um, things you can look at are things like row spacing, plant spacing, and row orientation. And I, I really want to emphasize this because we tend to Sometimes it's not an option because of the layout of the land and, and the ability to use your machinery and so on. But if you know you have a predominant wind direction on your farm and you can take advantage of that by planting your rows into the predominant wind direction, 
Whenever the wind blows, it's going to be moving more effectively down the rows than trying to cross the rows. And so you end up with much more effective natural drying of the canopy between rains, between irrigations. And it can make a massive difference in buildup of certain fungal and bacterial diseases if you can take advantage of airflow in your area. And this is why planting, say, a seed crop surrounded by tall trees on all sides is going to really build up humidity in your canopy much better than if you can get good airflow through your seed crop. So ventilation practices are allowing that crop to be able to dry out more quickly uh, using these kinds of practices can, can be very, very effective. I've seen this in our own trials with cabbage seed crops in Alton area um, when we've actually inadvertently planted in the predominant wind direction. We were trying to create disease for a research trial and I couldn't because I had done exactly what I would tell a grower to do in terms of getting the canopy to dry out. And a grower nearby who had the same variety, same year, but planted perpendicular to predominant wind direction had about five times as much disease as I was able to get in our trial. And we were inoculating my trial and the grower was not. So it just was really powerful illustration of taking advantage of what Mother Nature can offer for um, keeping your canopy dried out is, is, is important. I, I see, Michaela, there's some questions. I haven't actually been paying attention to the chat box, but let me know if there's anything I should be answering. Okay, great, Lindsay. Maybe uh, let's shoot for another 10 minutes and then we'll break for questions. Okay. 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 So just uh, thinking about uh, other cultural practices, transplanting and hygiene, trying to keep your seedlings healthy when you transplant, uh, avoiding getting those transplants too wet when they're being handled, particularly for things like black leg of brassicas is really important. Um, and awareness of things that can be me mechanically transmitted. For example, the black rot pathogens, Anthemonas campestris, campestris, and, back, and brassicas, when you're handling, can be very, very readily be um, spread by people handling those seedlings. Um, if you have smokers on your farm, or if you are a smoker, you when you smoke a cigarette, you are picking up tobacco mosaic virus on your fingers because that that is a virus that can withstand the desiccation process. So it's on cigarettes, and if you then handle Solanaceous seedlings, there's a very high risk you'll transmit TMV to those seedlings. So very strong recommendation if you or any of your workers or smokers is that when they take a smoke break, they wash their hands with warm soapy water before they go back to handling these seedlings. Uh, very important in greenhouse operations, of course. I won't get into details of chemicals, but I know that there are, um, as organic growers, there are materials registered, approved by Omri that you can use in organic cro crops. But just recognize that um, I, I think this is an important thing that's not always understand. When the label for a product, whether it's organic or conventional, says that it can control certain diseases, there's a very unfortunate situation with the law in this country that they don't have to prove efficacy in order to state something controls something on the label. They just have to prove that it's not going to damage that crop. So um, a lot of things that are on labels are not necessarily particularly accurate with respect to efficacy. So just be really careful and, and um, a healthy dose of skepticism when you read labels of what products are supposed to control what diseases. But also very importantly, if you want to get the most out of your applications is to look at when's appropriate time to put them on, how do you put them on to get maximum coverage and making sure that the, the products will actually control the true cause of the disease you're seeing in your field. Because I see a tremendous amount of use of products that are just totally wrong for the disease that's actually present in a field. Um, coverage can be really important. I, we've seen studies where, for example, in, um, bacterial leaf bud and carrot seed production, when you can chemigate, for example, a copper through your sprinklers, if you're using sprinkler irrigation versus a spray boom, that better coverage carrying that copper down into the canopy where the disease pressure is highest, lower in the canopy, does give you less disease pressures uh, indicated by the lower bar here. Um, timing of application can be important. In spinach, um, when you, uh, you may recall I mentioned two leaf spot pathogens. We have shown that the Stymphilium leaf spot pathogen, if that inoculum arrives on your crop, your spinach seed crop during pollination, so when pollen is present, you get far more disease than if there's no pollen present. So the timing of any application in relationship to flowering can be really important. Um, and so we tend to say to growers, if you're going to put on a fungicide to try and control stymphalin because you're concerned about the disease and conditions are getting kind of wet around that time, 
looking at getting a protective application on just before you get into full pollination is really one of the most critical times and probably the only critical time we tend to see usually for, for this disease. Um, you know, we talk about planting resistant cultivars. Um, using resistance cultivars and seed production is great if you have resistance and if the cultivars you're wanting to grow have resistance. But this is often a very difficult situation in seed production if you've got a popular variety and it happens to be susceptible to certain pathogens. You're going to have to deal with that as growers. Um, and particularly where you deal with hybrid seed production, and sometimes one parent may have some resistance, but the other one not, like you saw in that spinach seed production situation, um, that photo I mentioned and I'm showing again. And it's for this reason that we do a tremendous amount of screening. Every winter, we offer a soil bioassay to spinach seed growers. We, we take soil from their field. They bring soil to us. We plant it out. These are just soils growers submitted in one of those years. And we plant it with a spinach line that has partial resistance, moderate susceptibility or highly susceptible and look at how much disease develops in those fields. We've been doing this bioassay for spinach seed growers for 14 years now. And this is kind of what happens if we end up with a soil from a grower's field that has a high risk, everything dies. Something with a moderate risk, we see the susceptible parent dies, but something with resistance might survive and a field with a low risk looks like this. So we have been running these tests every year, every winter for spinach seed growers because of how high a risk this disease is for seed production. And we've tested over 600 fields over the last 14 years and really helped growers um, avoid these wipeouts because of that long rotation that's needed. We also offer screening for parent lines to understand how susceptible they are. So we inoculate, we grow these parent lines or varieties for seed companies in medium that we've inoculated with the two races of the pathogen. And we're able to show them just how susceptible their lines are. So here, for example, this, um, okay, sorry, this is a bio so I'll just move on to the parent line one. Here you can see this parent is susceptible to race one, but some resistance to race two. This parent is very uh, good resistance to race one, but highly susceptible to race two. And we've been offering this kind of testing to help companies understand the susceptibility of their lines, which is part of the risk USC growers have to deal with. With respect to seed treatments, um, I mentioned examples of diseases that can be controlled with things like hot water seed treatment, black rot, black leg on brassicas are examples where you can treat the seed with hot water uh, to control pathogens, but others are, are um, those treatments just don't work because they'll kill the seed before they kill the pathogen. There are disinfectants that can be used, um, but they tend to only work against infection that's limited to the outside of the seed. Um, and just being aware of the nuances around when seed treatments work, what kind of conditions they have to be treated under. Seed treatments and seed treating is a really complicated science. And if you're getting into this business, really get together with people who have some experience to help guide you so you don't end up damaging your seed and you're using um, treatments that, that are gonna work. Um, and these become important when you look at pathogens where there's thresholds for seed production. I mentioned that the black rot pathogen in brassicas is a quarantine disease. So if one seed in 30,000 tests positive, the seed lot cannot be sold. Um, in contrast, if you look at xanthomonas on carrots, there is no quarantine. You don't see a yield loss typically until you get really high levels of 100,000 colonies of the pathogen per gram of seed. So much higher tolerance for these pathogens. So you know, there's, there's a lot of variation in what seed industry can tolerate or seed growers should be able to um, be aware of with respect to high risk diseases versus lower risk diseases. And a lot of things can influence this risk for seed transmission. I'm not gonna go through these in detail. I'll just list them here. All the things that influence your risk of seed transmission. Um, um, I'm gonna provide these slides to Kayla, Michaela as a PDF so she can share these with you because we don't have time to go through all of this. But this is why the science of seed pathology, seed transmission and risk analysis gets complicated because all of these things can influence that risk. Um, I want to mention one disease related to this seed transmission risk, and that's bacterial leaf spot of beet and chard. And beet and chard seed production is pretty big in Western Washington, Western Oregon. We're the primary region for the U.S. Um, and this disease is caused by Pseudomonas syringi aptata. It's a bacterium, very readily seed borne, affects everything in that uh, beet family, um, likes cool, wet conditions, uh, very readily seed borne and seed transmitted. Um, apparently, some of these strains can go to other hosts, but we don't know a lot of information about this. 
We've done field trials for a number of years looking at the risk of seed transmission. Here on the lower right, you can see a picture of what happens when you plant infected seed under conducive conditions. You can see that's really non-marketable. Um, and baby leaf production is really the high risk for this because of the dense population of planting and the sprinklers. So we've had a, a grad student, Stephanie Crane, look at seed transmission rates um, in each of these trials shown in these four figures. The lots she planted had increasing levels of infection in that seed. And you can see at low, low levels of infection, you might not see any disease depending on the season. But uh, in August 2020, when we had quite a bit of rain towards the end of her trial, even the seed lots with the lowest level infections showed disease because of that risk of seed transmission that's very influenced by environmental conditions. Um, I've mentioned already the CRISPR quarantines. I won't go into detail on that because uh, of time, but just be aware of that. If you grow brassica seed crops, there are legal requirements with respect to making sure your seed is clean that you plant and that you're not spreading those pathogens. So I will just move on through this for the sake of time and get to the seed testing part. Uh, Michaela asked me to provide a list of labs that can provide seed health testing. Um, these three labs, California Seed and Plant Lab, Eurofins, and Iowa State University, all have seed labs that, um, with seed pathologists that do a tremendous amount of specialty crop seed testing. They all have tests that are uh, approved by the National Seed Health System, which is the USDA system to make sure labs are competent that can offer this seed testing. Um, the contact information is on the slide. If you need seed tested, um, you're welcome to contact these labs. I encourage you to talk to them on the phone before you send seed in to know what kind of seed sample size they need, what it is they should be testing, what you're concerned about. You're also welcome to contact me if you have questions and I can um, try to guide you in the process if you're needing some testing. And so with that, I will um, open it up for questions, Michaela, because I I know I've thrown a lot out there, but it's a big topic to cover in an hour. <laughs> it is. Thank you. It's always an education. Um, thank you for also sharing your slides. I will go ahead and post those into the seed commons. And we will be also developing a seed production resource guide for Washington State. So we'll lean on Lindsay for some of those um, advising and resources and testing opportunities and needs. Um, information about quarantine. Do we have any questions? Feel free to go ahead and, and raise your hand if you'd like to share a question out loud or if you're more comfortable, you can put it into the chat. No one has any disease problems. <laughs> <laughs> Overwhelmed? <laughs> Hello. Hi, Katie. Hi. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm on my phone. Um, I, this is always a question that I have, but um, I was wondering if there is um, a good way to see pictures of common Western Washington diseases with their names and descriptions of them. So yeah, I'm always wanting yeah. to be good, able to look at. Good question, Katie, and I should have put that on the slides, but the, a, a really good resource um, for what is prevalent in Washington, in the Tri-State Pacific Northwest is the Pacific Northwest Disease Management Handbook, PNW Disease Management Handbook. There's an insect management handbook, a weed management handbook, and a disease one. Uh, Oregon State University drives that, but it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort of OSU, WSU, and U of I. They tend not to have as many pictures, but they've got a, a lot of uh, common diseases listed and management options, both culturally and uh, chemically. Uh, we have, um, I, I lead a vegetable extension group. We have a it's called the PNW Veg, <laughs> VEG, and we have a photo gallery that we've been trying to build up um, to capture pictures exactly as you said, Katie. What do these diseases look like? What's the pathogen name versus the disease name? Um, common symptoms we might see. We've been building this slowly but surely over the last almost 20 years. WC is right in the middle of transferring all our websites to a whole new system. So right now you can still access it because I looked up some information just a few days ago, but um, there may be a period of disruption as WSU, because we've got thousands of images on there and just trying to get, and a lot of it's, you know, approval from the submitter of the photos and anyway, 
but the PNW badge is, is a site we, we developed to try and with a photo gallery to try and address this very question, Katie. Can you look at questions and say, do these symptoms look right or not? Um, Jenny Glass is the diagnostician at WSU Puyallup. Um, she runs the plant clinic, plant and insect diagnostic lab, J-E-N-N-Y, and her last name is G-L-A-S-S. -S. So you can look up WSU plant and insect diagnostic lab. It'll take you to Jenny's website and she has information. You can call her and talk about things if you have questions. Um, she can and look can look at samples. You're also welcome to contact me. I, if I get overwhelmed, I forward it to Jenny because I'm not a diagnostic service, but I do often help seed growers with diagnos diagnostics because seed crops are kind of specialty and niche area that I focus on. So um, there's a number of resources for you, Katie. <laughs> Great, thank you. Lindsay, we have a couple questions from Sarah from Adaptive Seed based in okay. Oregon. She asked, is black rot in brassica soil borne? First question. Yeah, so actually it's not soil borne, um, Sarah, which is one of the few saving graces about that pathogen. It is, it'll only persist in soil if there's infected tissue. And so the quicker that tissue breaks down, the quicker that inoculum goes away, which is great. However, the one thing you want to be cognizant of for brassica seed growers, as you know, brassica seed crops have this, they've developed these really thick stems. Uh, they're almost woody, they're so hard, and they take a long time to break down. And um, one of uh, the former WSU Extension specialist um, who was in Island County did a study when for his graduate school uh, project looking at persistence of the black rot pathogen in these brassica seed crops, cabbage seed crops in particular, and was able to recover the black rot pathogen on those cabbage stems for almost a year and a half after after harvest, because those stem tissue pieces, if they're not broken up, take a long time to break down. So it's something to keep in mind is that big woody stem tissue for cabbage seed crops and other brassicas is going to persist longer than the foliar tissue or, you know, the, the regular production crop might. Great. And uh, Sarah also asked, is that spinach soil bioassay available to growers outside of Washington State? Um, unfortunately, it's not, Sarah, because we I don't have a permit to receive soil samples from out of state um, um, because of the risk of moving soil between states. You have to have a special permit to work with soil from out of state. So I can receive soil samples from Washington, but right now I don't have a USDA APHIS permit to receive soil samples from out of state. I do have a permit for certain diseases, but not for soil. Um, so it's something that we've been talking about because um, the Willamette Valley is also a spinach seed production area and there's an interest for uh, helping spinach seed growers in Oregon. You guys in Oregon, the Willamette tend to have more ground to choose from and rotate than we do um, in Western Washington. But um, it certainly, you know, if, if you see a need, Sarah, let me know. We could talk about how you can create your own little bioassay and maybe try to mimic some of what we do. Um, I'd be happy to try and have that discussion with you. Great. Maybe you can share with me later the contact information of how to submit samples in Washington State. And what's the timing of that? When would you want to submit? Yeah. Your so we we get asked to do this at a very specific narrow time frame because seed companies, um, you know, we're talking about the bigger companies, tend to only release their contracts to growers in late fall, so November, early December. So growers aren't always willing to do this unless they know they have a contract because we charge $200 a field because it's a huge amount of work for us to do this. So we try to get the soil samples in by the end of that first week of December. It takes us, you know, last year we had 55 soils. It took us three weeks to process all those soils. We, we get five gallons per field and they have to shred it and partially dry it and amend it with limestone and put in pots and plant it and all have them planted on the same day. And we do four replications of three parents in every soil. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. And growers yeah. want the results before the end of January. So we right. do this intense bioassay. We create these highly conducive conditions in the greenhouse, warm temperatures. We monitor for other problems. We usually have an open house then in about the third week of January where we unrandomize everything. So each grower can come and look at all 12 pots for each of their fields and see how much risk there is. And often the seed contractor will come with them and we'll kind of assess which fields might be safe to go into. And then we also test their soil for verticillium, which is another 
wilt disease that can affect spinach, those results take an extra month to come out. So we provide those results by mid-February. We hope to give them to our growers by next week. So they have the ability to say, how much fusarium wilt risk do I have? How much verticillium wilt risk do I have? And then March 1st is the pinning meeting for these seed growers to know where their fields might ultimately be located. And so they take this information on fusarium risk, verticillium risk, and keep that in mind as they do the pinning meeting on March 1st to with working with the seed companies to finalize where these crops are located. So we, um, I usually send an announcement out to our Puget Sound Seed Growers Association in September to say, here are the dates. Here's what you need to submit if you want to include a field in the bioassay. And uh, Michaela, I don't know if you get on, on that list, but we should definitely, I, yeah. usually, I usually have a sent out through Don McMoran because he has the full growers list, but um, we should definitely include you in that. Yeah, I'd love to check in about that. I've been meaning to reach out to you about the pinning meeting. And is it too late to join that meeting? If we send you a, we have a couple of growers that we've been working with um, up at Viva Farm in Skagit okay. Valley. Okay. The pinning meeting is not something I control. The pinning okay. meeting is handled by Don yeah. McMoran because it's county okay. extension um, mediated. It's a, it, The pinning meeting is the Western Washington Small Seed Advisory Committee. Um, they They run that meeting. Don's the mediator as a neutral body. He's not tied to any one company, so he kind of mediates the pinning process. But um, the chair right now is Kelsey Hyatt from Vikima. She's the chair. So if you, uh, maybe Michaela, I can send you her contact details. Um, she's the current chair. Um, I think Bryn Holbert is the vice chair from Syngenta. Okay. So okay. I can send you their contact details and have you added. Yeah. Okay, okay. Lauren, thank you for adding links in the chat to some of those resources that Lindsay was mentioning. And we will also um, share those resources following up in the comments. We are at 1231. Um, I could talk to Z's with Lindsay all day long. Um, and we will also share this PowerPoint presentation with you all afterwards in a PDF in the comments. And this session was also recorded. So Thank you, Lindsay, as always, educational and reinforcing. And I think, you know, while Lindsay focused on some specific crops, keep in mind all of those basic principles and disease management that she was mentioning, they cross over whether you're growing herbs or flowers or anything else and um, staking. I can't be a big enough proponent of staking, keeping those plants upright, not down in the soil, of course. So Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Can we get a unmute and a little round of applause for, for Lindsay? Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Abba as our facilitator to lead us into the next session. Thank you, Lindsay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Lindsay. you so much. <laughs> I know there are so many people on this call who have benefited greatly from your work over the years. So thank you for making it available for everyone here and just for who you are and what you do. So thank you for being here. And um, we're gonna go into our closing ceremony. How did this happen? We're already at the end, y'all. This is it. And um, you know, people, whoever's still on the call, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here.